Alex, a uh, warm welcome here to the IPS podcast. It's so good to finally talk to you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for inviting me on the show. So, uh, of course, we're going to talk about, you know, your story and, and just like what happened to you and all the lessons that you just learned along this wild journey that you've been on. Uh, but I'm just too curious, actually. Uh, that's why I'm going to start the interview by asking, you recently came back from Namibia, like, what is it, like three, four weeks ago? Yeah, and I did, yeah. I'm just curious to ask, like, how was, how was your trip? And could you tell us, like, why you went to there? Yeah, so um, a few years ago, I met a guy who just retired from uh, the city of London, very successful. Um, and when he retired, he felt that he wanted to do more adventurous stuff, you know, cooler stuff, really. And it was just by chance I met this chap at, at a show. And uh, he said, look, I know you like adventure. Do you want to do something with me? And, you know, we'll, 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 maybe we'll go to Ethiopia and, you know, we'll do some traveling. And I was like, well, yeah, that sounds great. Why not? So we got chatting and a few years back then to Ethiopia, I had an amazing time. Um, and we we worked with the University of Southampton here in the UK. And the students built me a custom made solar assisted battery powered four wheeled hand cycle. Cool. So the world's first weirdest vehicle. Um, and it was designed for me that my prosthetics would attach to it and I'd be able to cycle it through Ethiopia's mountain ranges and ultimately summit their highest mountain. So we did that in 2019. It was amazing, fantastic trip, absolutely life altering. And then David and I decided that we would do the wild wheelchairs project. So we set the project up and we said, right, what we'll do is we'll make vehicles to cover terrain such as mountains, desert, snow and ice, water, and then something to do with the air. Mm -hmm. That was that was our, our master plan. So we we ticked the mountain box back in 2019. You and did then that together, sorry to interrupt, you did that together with someone else who also was uh, an amputee, right? I did, yeah, I'm a bit. Yes. Yeah, she, um, a double amputee Ethiopian girl. She, she had her legs amputated. She was hit by a truck when she was three years old. She was playing on the road, the truck didn't see her, and wiped her legs out and she was incredibly fortunate to survive. Her healthcare in Ethiopia is sketchy at best. Um, and it was lucky that she was pretty close to a city and she got the right care and the right, right attention when she needed it. Um, but when she was taken home out of hospital by her mother, when she returned to the village that she lived in, the tribal elders took her mom to one side and said, look, Emma Bet is of no benefit to our community. Mm. You know, you might as well leave her in the ditch to die. She's never going to be part of what we've created here. And her mother was mortified and horrified really at their attitude and moved into the city in Bahadar. Um, and now Emmabet's become this incredible uh, voice of uh, disability in Ethiopia and an amazing wheelchair basketball star. And she's an absolute, she's a goddess. She's an incredible lady. So her and I went through the mountains together and it was, you know, it was, it, it was a one-off, you know, they'd never seen a quadruple amputee, not a white guy like me, and they'd never seen a double amputee Ethiopian on a vehicle like we had ever, cycling through the villages and their and their regions to get to the highest mountain. It was just incredible. Um, and we also set up a, a wheelchair factory to make affordable wheelchairs when we were there because we felt, or I felt, that going into these countries having great times is one thing, but I felt that I had much more to give and more to offer when I was there. And the wheelchair factory we set up by Hadar is still making wheelchairs now. Um, you can buy them for two hundred dollars. You know, wheelchair that I use about this. so you know, there's no way in the world an Ethiopian on a thousand dollars a year is ever going to be able to afford a singing or singing and dancing wheelchair like me. So, you know, it, it was about supplying the right equipment for the region at the right price. And that's what we tried to achieve with the factory. Um, unfortunately, Ethiopia went into um, a lot of civil war when we left in the north where we were. And, you know, there's an awful lot of amputees now making their way to Bahadar, where our, where our unit is. Um, but they're looking for prosthetics, crutches, walking frames. You know, it's quite, it's quite brutal what's happening over there. 
So the factory has kind of turned its attention to helping victims of war, which is great. You know, it's amazing. And it's a real legacy and it's something that we're incredibly passionate about. So in 2020, we agreed that we'd go to Mongolia to take a vehicle across the Gobi Desert. Uh, we were going to try and cycle 500 kilometers uh, over 10 days and get to work with charities over in Mongolia to see if we could help uh, amputees over there. Obviously, the pandemic came along, stopped all those plans. And then I had to have some surgery on my arm last November, unplanned, um, which meant that I couldn't do an event I was dreaming of for this year. And then David got in contact and said, look, why don't we try and go to Namibia? Namibia is a great country. I've been there. We could ship the bike out. You know, Windhoek is only 300 kilometers from the coast. You know, it could really work with the cross of the And I was like, I'm in hospital. It sounds like a great idea. Let's do it. So then we shipped the bike out in April, the ship. And unfortunately, when it got to Namibia, an east wind blew across the desert which meant that the container ship couldn't dock at the port. Oh, wow. So the container ship kept going with our bike and, <laughs> and ended up on the east coast of Africa, just outside of Durban. So when, when I arrived in Windhoek, uh, I had a Italian unicycle attachment, a battery-powered attachment that clips onto my wheelchair, which is designed for the streets of Italy, Milan, <laughs> London, <laughs> not for the desert. Oh, it was the only crazy. Big... <laughs> Oh, man, it gets worse. So it's the only vehicle that I take on the plane legally. Um, so I had one battery, I had one little bit. Uh, there was no way we could get the hand cycle to me in, in time for the event. And then four of our team out of 10 had COVID, so they couldn't travel. So we went depleted in numbers anyway. And I'm, I took my little mobility scooter across the desert. Bless it, it did about 100 kilometers and when I say it's probably the most uncomfortable, I mean, I, my spine was in bits by the end of the trip. Yeah. Oh, man, I was just aching, really aching. But it was really cool, and the country was amazing. It wasn't the event that we had planned, but, you know, we couldn't we couldn't odds the east wind, you know, pushing the boat or making it unable to dock. So instead, when we got back to the UK, actually before we got back to the UK, I got in contact with Rosemary Pleasant. We've got to do something. Okay. We've got to use the bike. It's not right that the students spent their year building it, and they don't get to see me sit on it and thrash it around somewhere. Um, so in November, I'm going to do a Le Mans event just down the road from where I live on a piece of military land, which is the ninety. I'm going to do ten of those, twenty-four hours to complete my five hundred kilometer journey on the hand cycle wow and hopefully, hopefully raise some money for a local charity so that's there's a plan b or the plan part a <laughs> so it's so, so many different plans but yeah the Namibia was beautiful and stunning i love africa there is very grounding i feel very at peace when i'm there i, I love the expanse i love the the terrain i love how hard it is i like the aggravation that goes with it i enjoy the problems um, and I was with my best mate for two weeks, Chris Bagley. So, you know, we had a great time. This is such like a beautiful glimpse of your current life and of your current like mindsets, you know, who you are today. But it, it took you a while. You had to go literally through hell first to get to where you are today, you know. Could you like take us back to november 2013 right like nine years ago yeah. could you just take us back to that day or those days when yeah all this was happening or when all this started yeah so um in 2013 up until up to that point i'd done two things right in my life i met lucy my partner and i had my son sam um and that they were by far my two greatest achievements at that point and I was a, a stay-at-home dad. When, when Sam was born, Lucy was adamant that she wasn't going to stay at home. She's a, a businesswoman, an entrepreneur. She was desperate to get back to work. 
So 48 hours after my son was born, she went back to work and then I was holding this amazing baby. Um, and I just loved the next two and a half years. I spent time with him. I was with him all the time. It was great. But, you know, honestly, I wasn't a great dad. I was, at that point, Lucy and I had um, two businesses, two pubs. We had a restaurant and a, a, over in Stockbridge, which is the town that I, was, I lived in for most of my life. And we had a little countryside pub um, about half an hour in. The two businesses, very similar, very close to each other. And we were setting up the restaurant. So the pub was existing. I was kind of in charge of that one, but not doing a very good job. And Lucy was setting up the new restaurant and just crushing it. She was doing really well. And I I was a bit kind of listless in my life. I didn't really know what I was, I was going to do. You know, my son was getting to an age where he would go to preschool and I was left with the palm of my hands. What was I going to do? I'm not sure. And I remember I just, I was always a big drinker, but as soon as we started to live above the pub, my drinking got out of control. So I was probably drinking, I don't know, about 80, 90 pints a week. Um, and then maybe two or three bottles of wine at night every day. So from midday to midnight, really, I was drinking. Do you and, know, like, this is a very personal question now, but do you know why you were drinking so much? Like what led to you drinking so much during those years? I think all it was... I mean, I, I used to I used to love a party, you know, and I used to love going out. And uh, for whatever reason, I was quite good at drinking. Um, and I think it, it got out of control because I just didn't know where my life was heading. I couldn't see where I fit or where I was going to fit. And I guess looking back, I didn't know who to ask, who to talk to. Uh, I, I just I wasn't sure what I wanted to do and I could have done anything you know in hindsight I could have done whatever I wanted you know I was I was very fortunate in the position we we're in um but then you know for whatever reason I just never asked and I never looked uh well enough you know I didn't seek out the right information and you know and in hindsight I should have done that many many years prior to falling ill um but then lucky for me I did fall ill you know that November because of the, the restaurant and the pub, you know, we were, customers are coming in all the time with colds and flus. And, you know, we were, we were seeing hundreds of well, thousands of people a week. And I just caught what I thought was man flu, common, common cold. Um, and after a few days, it got worse and then it got really bad. And I, I'd never been that ill ever. Yeah. I, I remember hot and cold sweats. I remember, you know, bad stomach, didn't want to eat, didn't want to drink. Um, and then after about a couple of weeks, you know, I was really, really ill and it became flu. So I thought, yeah. and I'd never had flu. So I just assumed this was normal for flu symptoms. Um, and then one night I went to the loo and there was blood in my urine. Okay. And I remember, I remember thinking, oh man, what's going on here? And I went back to bed. I spoke to Lucy. Lucy was like half asleep saying, look, go back to sleep in the morning. We'll call the doctor. I remember going back to sleep. And then when I woke in the morning, Lucy had gone to set up the restaurant and I was at, at, at the pub on my own. My son had been at my parents the night before, so he wasn't there. And I remember waking up and I, my head was just absolutely a huge headache, a shocking headache. And then I, I realised I couldn't really move my arms properly, I couldn't use my legs properly. I was semi-conscious. I was all over the place. Um, I tried to put my clothes on, I couldn't do it. And then I remember a knock on my back door. So I remember I remember sort of staggering, almost sliding down the stairs to get to the back door. And when I opened the door, um, I managed to unlock it. I don't know how I managed to do that, but I managed to unlock it. And then when I opened the door, Lucy and my stepfather were there. And their faces, they just went, their faces were in horror um, because all my skin is starting to turn purple, um, starting to balloon. Um, I was in a real mess. So they called the paramedics straight away. Um, the paramedics arrived within five minutes. Five minutes, luckily enough for, for me, it was a Sunday morning, so there was no traffic. And as soon as they got to me, they said, "Right, we need to get into ICU immediately." Um, at this point, I'm not even sure he's going to make it in the ambulance. So we need to we need to get to ICU within 15 minutes. Winchester on a good day was about 20 minutes away, and luckily it was a Sunday, so we just shot straight through, no traffic, got to Winchester in time. 
I remember the double doors flying open, lots of doctors descending on me, asking me questions. Um, and I couldn't really answer. And Lucy was you know, trying her best to answer questions. And uh, there was a shift change in the consultants and the new consultant came over. He just arrived and he said, do we know what this gentleman's suffering with? One of the doctors said, well, we think he's got Bar's disease because he lives near, uh, walks his dog on the riverbank. He's got storm drains, you know, in the back garden of the pub and the restaurant. So it could be Bar's disease. Um, and the consultant said, no, I've seen it once before in South Africa. This is strep A. And with that, I was placed on life support. Uh, and and the next four days, I have no recollection whatsoever. Could um, you just explain a second what strep A is for anyone listening who's not familiar with it? So strep A, it, it just leads to sepsemia, basically. Um, and we've all got strep in our throats. You know, so yeah. I know in the UK, we don't call it strep, we just call it a sore throat. But I know in the US, it's, it's, strep, it's strep throat. And that's 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 all I had, um, and you can get different. I've had strep A, B, G. I've all I've had the, the alphabet of strep for some reason. It's just a bacteria, but, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. For whatever for whatever reason, my immune system didn't want to fight something that I'd had before. You know, I had colds when I was younger, as, as an adult. You know, and I, I was absolutely fine, but for whatever reason, this time it, it didn't choose to fight. Um, and it led to sepsis, sepsemia, um, sepsis, basically, uh, toxic shock syndrome. Yeah, I had some necrotizing fasciitis thrown in there. Um, so basically, my extremities were being were being destroyed from the outside in. Um, so it attacks like your nose, your lips, your ears, fingertips, toes, um, and so my body was getting blacker and blacker over time as the infection was drawing and it, what it tries to do is get to your heart yeah, to, yeah. To, to wipe you out. Mm. Um, and the problem is if it gets above your waist and near to your internal organs, then you're in real trouble. So uh, we didn't know any of this at that point. You know, we, I was just fighting to stay alive. I didn't, I didn't know I was doing that. Um, and I, the, for my trip in Ethiopia and, and also in Namibia, the guy, the doctor that comes with me is the man that saved my life. Okay, and, wow. Um, this guy, we were chatting in Namibia, watching this amazing sunset, just Jeff and I. And we were talking about the documentary that was made on Ethiopia. Um, and I said, I, I always thought I had 3% chance of survival. So I've always said, and I'm sure someone told me that early doors. And we were talking about it. And he said, mate, you didn't even have that. You were less than a percent. He said, you, he said, you were, you were out, you were gone. You know, and, and luckily he he tried something. Um, he gave me a massive dose of steroids, um, as well as a drug that apparently in in the in the nursing and the doctor fraternity, the drug that they gave me, I can't remember the name of it, mm -hmm. but they call it embalming fluid. So they, they were they were they were all, almost certain I was on the way out. Um, but the steroid, the massive dose of steroids, for whatever reason brought me back and, and woke me up and, and I, I came around um, unaware of what had gone on. Uh, I couldn't really remember much of the past two or three weeks. Sure. I remember lots of people coming to see me and I, I just assumed that because I'd woken up in hospital that I was going to get better and this was the beginning of my or, or, or I got through the worst of it. You know, right, I'm, I'm alive so now I'm just going to get better and walk out that was in my mind. Um, but Winchester Hospital said, look, we can't treat you anymore. We're going to hand you over to Salisbury, which is about 40 minutes away from where, where I was. And they wouldn't tell me why. They just said, we cannot continue with your care. That was the official tagline. And, and we didn't really know why. We kept asking, but they wouldn't tell us. So I just assumed that going to Salisbury just meant that I had a few weeks there and then I, then I go home. It was just a move, different hospital bed. You know, I, I didn't understand. And then when I got to Salisbury, I met my plastic surgeon. Um, and she then delivered the bombshell that was, I was going to lose my left arm. She Why? Said, you know, like, you know what the reason is? Why? Because the bacteria just killed it all? Or, or like... Yeah, so what, basically the bacteria, it, it killed everything. So it's killing the tissue, the muscle, the nerve yeah. endings. It was all being destroyed. 
and it was working its way up my arm and my left arm was worse affected at the beginning but that was the first amputation because it got so close to my heart they said we'll amputate we'll have to amputate wow. your left arm yeah. almost immediately and then over the next few weeks i lost both legs above the knee they saved my right arm with a pioneering surgery that involved taking the 17 inch of my the 17 inch flap of my left shoulder and back and they rebuilt my right arm from the shoulder down because they felt that if they could save one hand that would be the key to independent living down the line so they did that which is amazing um and then they moved a piece of my right back and shoulder and they moved that onto my face uh, a few months later so i've had about 130 hours i think of plastic surgery um all told over the last eight or nine years um and it, yeah it was a, a a torrid time i i was i was unaware i knew that my limbs were being amputated and i was very sad that i couldn't see my family but i didn't really understand the gravity of what was going on uh it was far worse than my family my family were watching me being just butchered you know it, it wasn't that, but it, that's how it felt to them True. they were like every day we were going in and you would you were missing more things and it was very 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 difficult for them um yeah so it, it was an amazing i look back on it it was an amazing time then but now down the line it was an amazing time so i really shouldn't be here mm. so the fact that they were doing everything in their care to try and give me a chance of life yeah you know, I, I wasn't out of the woods of the chance of passing away until early January. Um, you know, so I had four, five, six, about eight weeks of really being touch and go. Do you today know now, like so many years later, a bit more about why your immune system didn't respond to the bacteria? Is it like, do they know no. anything more? No, we have no idea. We've tried... Um, We've taken part in lots of studies, DNA studies, yeah. uh, genealogy studies, all the things that we could try and find out, you know, was it passed down from a parent? Was it my grandparent? Um, there is no accurate way of knowing why at that particular time my immune system didn't want to fight. Now, I just, I assumed it would have been my alcohol content, the intake, but even that was discounted because my internal organs were functioning at 100 percent so i had full liver function my kidneys were fine so i hadn't actually done any damage that could possibly that could have made my system weakened um which is a miracle really for what i drank um and yeah to this day we're we're none the wiser as to why i a that i survived it and b I, my immune system just wouldn't and still doesn't fight the strep now uh, you know i've had it a few times since and it, it every time now that we're aware of the situation if i get the slightest runny nose then i'm straight into my doctors on antibiotics and i'm treated immediately and and it clears up and it goes away so it, you know if it's caught in time it's manageable um in hindsight i remember my my doctor coming to see me in hospital who was my my local doctor, my GP, um, and he came to see me, and he he was like, "Man, you know, I'm so sorry." And I said, "If I'd have come to you before all this happened, with a runny nose and a sore throat, would you have done anything different? Would you have treated me or given me anything?" And he went, "Well, no, because you know it's cold and flu season, and with respect, your alcohol was out of control. You know, there's nothing we could have given you." that would do anything in your system. So even if you'd come to me, I wouldn't have given you any drugs because I don't think it would have worked. And I certainly wouldn't have diagnosed strep A. He said, under no circumstance would I have thought at that point that you had strep. So we were kind of vindicated that we didn't go and see the doctor in a way because we had this kind of we had two or three months before I saw him of thinking, what if we'd done this and what if we'd done that? Would I, would I be here now? So when he came, it was quite, it made us all feel a bit more at ease in the situation that there was nothing we could have done. It is what it is. And let's try and move on. I, um, 
I want to share a photo of you when you were back in the hospital, if that's fi fine from you. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. So I'm just going to share my screen here. You can uh, see this photo, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, but that was... Yeah. Can you, say, can, can you tell us like how many weeks or months or yeah, how long were you in the hospital here? Because you still had your right arm. Yeah, so that that was about April. 2014 yeah. and it was the first time we were approached by a, a local newspaper mm. that had heard through a friend of a friend about what happened about the odds of me surviving mm. you know this guy and he's lost all his limbs it's you know it was a big story yeah um and i remember my, my surgeon coming to see me and she said look we've been contacted by this newspaper are you happy for them to photograph you in your condition and I said, yeah. I said, I'm not, I'm not fussed. Um, and she went, are you sure? Because, you know, it's quite, it's visually, it's quite impactful. Sure. Um, yeah. And I, I said, look, if my family are happy, then I'm happy. And Lucy was fine with it. Um, and the, the photographer came in and, and he took some photos. So that photo went out in a newspaper. Um, yeah, in, in April, I think it was, 2014. And then that kind of kick-started the journey to where I am now. Okay, uh, okay. It, it, it was that, in terms of getting the word out of what happened, that mentally I was absolutely fine with it, um, mm. that I was coping, that, that, yeah, I was just happy to be alive, really happy to be alive. Um, because if you see this photo right now, you know, seeing yourself, like, staring at you now back so many years ago what is like the first thing that kind of goes through your mind seeing yourself i remember how much pain i was in uh -huh. um and that kind of that raises the hairs on the back of my neck just thinking back to that point um i remember it, it just it evokes memories of the hospital probably more than the pain mm. because what i the care and treatment that i received in Winchester and Salisbury was just, it was life altering. And uh, it sounds a bit weird when you're, when they're amputating and they're doing all these things to you, but I just saw something so incredible. And, and it was in my mind, I'm like, how is this free at the point of entry? How am I getting all this for nothing? Yeah. And I, I couldn't, I couldn't get my head around it. And, you know, in that time, my plastic surgeon had become uh, 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 my listener, my mentor. She was just a beautiful person inside and out. And her and I created this, we kind of built this amazing bond, which I'm sure is quite common with surgeons that do amazing work like she does. Um, and yeah, I remember the nights that she would sit by my bedside and we'd talk about everything, about my future, about my past, about the surgeries and about everything that, you know, I could go and do and what the military, what the injured lads were doing and that there's a life outside the unit when it went out there waiting for me if I want it. Everything was positive. And I think, so I look at that picture and I think, wow, I'm lucky to be alive. And and the guy in that, in that hostel bed there couldn't have imagined the guy that I am now. Not in a, not a million years would I think I would be who I am now in when I was in that position. Do you still remember like what was going through your mind like right there at that day or during that photo? Yeah, so so right then I'm thinking this must be really weird for the photographer. And I, and I was asking him questions, have you, ever, have you ever seen a person like me and stuff like that? <laughs> um, yeah. Uh -huh. And then when I was in hospital, my room was always one of laughter and joy. Um, I always had people come and see me. You know, every day, I remember one time there was like 14 people in my room and the room was tiny and it was just like a social, it was like being out every night. It was amazing. Um, and, the, you know, the healthcare assistants were great. The nurses were great. My surgeon was just a goddess. Um, yeah, it was, it was the most amazing, I think it was seven months initially. Um, and then my blessing, my poor old right arm, um, you know, I think about six months, no, two months later, I think, two and a half months later, that was to be amputated. 
it just the, the what we didn't know then is that I had strep in my bone in my right arm and it was being weakened all the time. We, we had no way of knowing. And I, I rolled over in bed in July and I broke my arm clean in half. You broke and it? Yeah. So just by the end right. of that, that wrist brace ends, yeah. I broke my, I broke my yeah, arm. Yeah, I see. Wait, so here, right? Yeah, just below that. It, oh, okay. It, it, it just snapped clean in half. Um, um, which was, again, it, it was just so incredibly fortuitous because I remember going back in and seeing my plastic surgeon. I was rushed back into A&E immediately. I couldn't feel the arm. That was, that was the weird thing. I was looking at my arm with my hand by my elbow and I'm thinking, I can't feel that. That's the weirdest thing ever. And I was rushed back in Salisbury and I met with my plastics team and they were really, so, I could see tears in their eyes. And I couldn't quite understand the severity of what was going on. And it was quickly put in a cast and I was having tests and swabs being sent off everywhere. And I remember my plastic surgeon coming in saying, uh, right at the end of that day, she came in and said, look, um, we've got two options. We can try and say that we can try and pin it, but it means you've got two years of looking at something that may never ever work again. And, and it will stop your rehab. You won't be able to play on the floor with your son. You won't be able to do anything. You know, you'll just be at home for two years looking at something that may or may not work. Or we can amputate. And I immediately said amputate. So I wasn't willing to hold up my life anymore. Yeah. Um, I wanted to move on and get on. I get that. And, uh, and she said, look, well, you, you can't make that call on your own. Go and discuss it with Lucy. So I went back to her, went back home. I said to Lucy what was happening. And she's like, I agree. Let's amputate. So a few a few days later, I'm back in Salisbury and I just had my arm amputated, and it was touch and go as to whether I'd keep my elbow joint. So we were quite worried about that. Mm-hmm. So when I woke when I woke up and I saw my right arm missing, I could see my elbow joint. So I was overjoyed immediately that I still had it because I knew that I could get a prosthetic. I knew that I'd be able to work with that. Mm-hmm. And then my surgeon comes in and she goes, "We've had all your results back from the swabs," and I was like, "Okay." And she goes, "Well, we." We knew that you it could be strep in the bone. Mm-hmm. Anyway, it's now, it's now been confirmed. But what we didn't tell you at that point is that if you hadn't have broken your arm, the strep would have worked its way up past your elbow. Okay. And, and the likelihood is that you might not have even been aware of it until it was too late. And you might have lost your entire arm to your shoulder. Wow. And she goes, if you didn't, if you left it another week or so, the chances are the strep would have got to your heart and it would have killed you and you would have known nothing about it. Damn so man. I was like, oh my God, <laughs> I mean, how, poor, how lucky was that? So I broke it to find the strep in there and then had it amputated. I was so lucky. And I think that was like the, that was like the turning point for all of us. It was like, right, life, life is for living now. We're going to do everything and anything that comes our way and we're Amazing. just going to enjoy it and do it and n- never look back. Damn, so and that's, all, and that's what we've done. It's been amazing. I have uh, actually one more photo of you, uh, and I think you might know which one. Uh, this is you. <laughs> yeah. That's me. Yeah, with so that, all your limbs. <laughs> yeah. Where so was this photo was, taken? That was at the back of our our pub in the countryside, and I I I built that barbecue, and um, and then there's lots of like little seating pods out the back through those little gl- through those windows uh-huh. uh, so i would i would cook on the barbecue some nights um for customers and that was that was my little area out the back so yeah that's the old me so that the fact that it's dark would mean that i'm probably drunk in that photo mm. honestly what is like the first thing that goes through your mind like seeing this photo and seeing yourself like back then with limbs just the guy with limbs i just see as a it was a waste of you know i, I was wasting myself or, or not using i was, wasn't utilizing myself as much yeah. as i should have been mm. you know and i i have i have a lot of regret mm. um so yeah i look at that that guy and i think man you just weren't doing anything where where was your head at uh yeah, I, I can't. I could not be further away from that guy now. I tried. 
Like, I know this is a hypothetical question, but like, if you could have a chat with yourself, like today, you know, with that person back then, would there be something that you would say to him that you know would like could help you back then, like enormously? I think you'd sort of pose the question and say, "Look, what would you do mm-hmm. if you had all your legs and arms amputated tomorrow? What mm-hmm. would you? What would you do?" And that guy would say, "Probably, well, I wouldn't do anything. I'd rather die, or I'd rather not, rather not survive." You know that that was the guy then, and I think you you don't know how much fight you've got within you until you're put into impossible situations. Very true. Yeah, and I just, you know, I I wish I knew that I had that in me mm. then, mm. that I had a strength of character that I never knew I had, that I had a a a, a will to survive and and then ultimately succeed that I didn't know I had. Um. Yeah. I yeah. I just mm. see it. I just see it, a waste of a, a body and a brain there. But again, that guy attracted Lucy, and that guy created Sam. So he wasn't all bad. <laughs> no, you're right. Exactly. He it certainly wasn't right. No, and he is you, right? I mean, you're a part of like he is you. You're just a different version of him. But so, definitely yeah, was not all brain. bad at all. No. No, it's the same brain, um, and it's. Just, I was told really early on with amputation that ninety-five percent is mental and five percent is physical. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I, I've always, I've always, whenever I'm, whenever I feel a bit low or I'm struggling, it comes to turn to something. I always remember that that it's it's the mind controlling the body. Get your mind straight, and the rest will follow. So yeah, it's, yeah. We, I've, I've learned a lot about myself, I think, in the last nine years. Because I'm sure that people listening right now must have wondered at least a few times, you know, just how how did you do this? You know, how did you continue fighting? And I know that from the interviews that I watched from you that it was your son, Sam. Yeah. But what I'm curious about is, like, when did you decide, like, that, you had to fight for your son, that you had to continue and that you didn't want it to be a victim. Like, do you remember the moment that like this spark of like fire ignited or did it like gradually build or how? how no, you... it, was, it was right at the beginning. So when I, I think I arrived in Salisbury, I don't know, end of November, maybe just for the end of November. And I remember getting to Christmas Eve and I hadn't seen my son at all in that period yeah. because it was too much, too much going on, too much for me, too much for him. And my surgeries were constant to that point. And I remember having surgery Christmas Eve and then they said, right, that's it for a few days. You're going to just be recovering now. So Lucy came to see me and I said, um, I mean, it's Christmas Day tomorrow. I just want to see Sam. All I, all I want to see, I don't want presents. I don't want to unwrap it. I just want to see my son. And she goes, okay, I'll bring him in. So Christmas Day comes and I, I wake up in the morning um, and I was just, I realised what day it was and I was so excited. I was unbelievable. I was just so, I couldn't wait to see him. Yeah. And I remember I could see the double doors of the unit and they were like porthole windows at the top. So I remember seeing Lucy through the porthole and then my excitement builds even more. And, and as she walks through the door, in behind her walks my little boy and I was sort of craning up to see if he could see me. And he's like looking around at all the machines and just wandering around. And then when he got closer and he looked and he could see me, he hid behind Lucy's legs. And and when I saw his face, I remember the look in his eyes, it's heartbreaking, but my, my heart just just shattered. He he looked at me like I was completely unrecognizable, which I probably was. Um and I just saw fear and and sadness in his eyes, and, and that made me feel terrible absolutely terrible and we tried to lucy tried to get him to sit on the bed and give me a cuddle we wouldn't do it and i remember we were smiling and trying to get through it but when lucy took him home i just i just bombed i mean i my mind just dropped and i couldn't see the point of it all i i you know 
how was I going to get him back? How was I going to be? And when I, when I started thinking about Sam, and I started thinking about Lucy, and I started thinking about my family and then my friends and then a job, and it all kind of built and built and built. And my mind just got heavier and heavier with the lady, that thing. Anyway, the nurse that was working that afternoon, there was a shift change, and a new nurse came on, and she came over to me. And she could see that I'd been crying, and she said, are you okay? And I said, no, my son came in, and he still wanted to, just, it was heartbreaking, and I explained what had gone on. And uh, the nurse, the healthcare assistants were great, and they would sit on my bed, and they'd chat, but they couldn't get me out of this kind of like, downward spiral I was on. And the nurse goes away, and she called Lucy, and she said, Lucy, look, Alex is so upset. He's seeing Sam, and it was a big thing today, and it didn't go as he planned. And, you know, he totally understands why Sam reacted like that, but he couldn't understand just how heartbreaking it was going to be. Yeah. And she said, is there anything else in his life that he loves as much as his son? And she said, the only thing he loves as much as me and Sam is his Labrador, Holly. <laughs> and uh, and the nurse said, look, I'm a, I'm a huge dog fan. I've got six dogs. Bring Holly in tonight. Don't tell anyone. Just bring the Labrador in. So I didn't know all this was being cooked up behind my back. And that night, about 10 o'clock, I remember seeing Lucy through the porthole glass again. I was scratching my thinking, why is she come back? And she opened the door and in burst my Labrador. My Labrador kind of burst oh. in and just ran around all the beds and just went around the whole unit. And the nurses foster and the doctors foster and all the patients that could move were pat her on the head and she'd jump up on the bed. And it was just the most incredibly joyous moment. I think all of us in that unit that night, Christmas, honestly, we were all, some of us were still on life support. You know, I was on dialysis, other patients were on dialysis. We were all going through it. But that unbridled joy of the dog lifted all our spirits. And then all of us were kind of just, yeah, just lifted, I guess. And, you know, she stayed for about 15 minutes, not very long. But when Lucy took her home, I think for the first time, we were all talking to each other or trying to talk to each other. You know, we were just at that moment with the, my Labrador was, was just, it was, for me, it was life altering because it made me realise that there was much more out there to fight for and, and it was worth doing. And I think she couldn't, she wouldn't have been able to explain that in words, but that, that Labrador was unconditional love. And she still recognised me and still knew that I was a dad, you know, all that. And it was it was great. And a week later, when I left that unit, I was the only one to survive out of that group of people that my lab saw that night. So to think that in those last few days and hours, that lab was a, a, a piece of joy for them. It just instilled a bit of a fight, I think, to make me think, right, you, you, you got out of that. You survived it. You know your Labrador still loves you, and you know you know that your son will come round, and you you know we'll make this work. And it was then, from that point on, there was never, there was probably four or five bad days from that moment in nine years, which is incredible, really. I mean, I just never stopped thinking that I could get through it, not once. And I don't think since that moment. I've, I've never been back to where I was when I saw my son's face. I've never been that low again. And I think that, you know, if I can avoid that that level, then I'm doing all right. You know, my head is well above water now and it's and it's been getting better and better since. But, yeah, seeing my son and seeing my Labrador. I mean, my lab, bless her, she passed away in lockdown. And mm. she was, I had, I had 11 amazing years with that dog. She was 11 and, years or how old? Yeah, she, yeah. She, yeah. And then when she died, I realized she probably had it the worst out of all of us because when I got home, I couldn't walk her. I had no way of putting her lead on and taking her out. And I, she, as she got older, I couldn't help her. I couldn't, I couldn't really do anything for the dog, if you know what I mean. And I think, I think that was probably really hard for that lad. Um, and when she passed away, it was just it was heartbreaking. Yeah. Um, but she did she changed all our lives you know in that 15 minute spell that she had in that ICU unit you know. so yeah, I have a lot to thank that dog for dogs are amazing or animals in general right but uh, dogs yes yeah I mean you see the therapy that they offer and you know whether it's physical or mental you know I, I've always had dogs and 
I remember when my Labrador passed away, I said to my other half, and I said to Sam, I said, there's no way I'm willing to live without a dog. <laughs> that, that, that isn't me. I'm a dog person. So now I have a little Jack Russell. Ah, so all right. A more, a more sensible sized dog. <laughs> and, I, and, I have, and we have a cat. And yeah, I mean, the joy that those pets bring and the difficulties and the trouble and all the aggravation <laughs> with it. I mean, there's so much fun. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, my lab, bless her, she was, she was life changing. Wow. For more than just one person, right? For more than just only you. That's just so amazing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. I and mean, I think, you know, that nurse, to, to do that, yeah. knowing the amount of trouble she could have got in for doing that. You know, and it was Christmas Day. I mean, it was just so amazing. Um, I knew I, I knew I had the best healthcare. I knew I was getting the best treatment, but that just took it to the next level for me. Yeah. And you know, I've regaled that story about seven million times, and I'll never ever forget what she did. Amazing. I read somewhere that you uh, also really liked the book *Men's Search for Meaning* by uh, Victor yeah. Franklin. And it truly is an incredible book. I've also read it uh, a few times. It's just amazing. Uh, do you recall out of the book what like uh, spoke the most to you? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I randomly, I got a, a, a check through the post. We set up the ICS Trust at that point. And this was probably, I think I just started my facial surgery. So that, this was uh, late 2014. And a, a, a letter came to our, our door and Lucy opened it and, she, and there was a check in there and she read it and she goes, you've got a check here from Coldplay. I said, I said, don't be ridiculous. We don't know. And she goes, no, there's a check here from Coldplay. And I looked at it and it was actually a check from Coldplay. What? And a, and a little note from Chris Martin saying, look, I've heard about what you're going through. I think it's amazing how you're dealing with it, you, you know, your, your capacity for it, what you're doing, how you feel about it. It's just unbelievable. And he'd read, and this story was from that that one picture that you showed earlier on. Uh -huh. that, news, that news article ended up in the New York Times, and that's where he read it. Wow. And, and, then, he, and then he searched me out, and he found the trust, and he, and he very kindly donated to it. And, and in this note, he said, look, you know, I think what you're going through is incredible, but if there's one thing I recommend for you is to read Man's Social Media by Vince Frankel. He said it's a, it's a, it's a really hard read, but yeah, yeah, I think there's, there'll be a lot a lot in there that you resonate with. And I'm I'm a terrible reader, shocking. And I thought, well, if Chris Martin's telling me to do it, then it must be all right. I mean, it's yeah. quite cool. <laughs> uh, so I, I remember I downloaded it onto my iPad and I had all the surgery coming out. So I had loads of time in hospital recovering to read the book. And I remember one night I was, I was, I was reading through it and once I started it, that was it. I was just, I motored through it. I just found it absolutely fascinating. Mm -hmm. And it, it got to the point, um, and it's about three in the morning, and my eyes are drooping. And I, and it, it wasn't a quote by Frankel, but it was uh, a quote in, in the text that said, once you work out the why, you will endure anyhow. Yeah. And it was like a lightning bolt moment. And it made me realize that my why is Lucy and Sam. They were, you know, it was Lucy, Sam, and my dog right at the top they were the why to begin with and you know at that point we were starting to do more with other amputees that were coming into it and we were helping them and you know they were then part of the why and the how was always going to be my limb difference my quadruple amputation how i live with facial disfigurement how i live with uh, quadruple amputation and i realized that the why was far outweighing the how by a mile and down the line, the why's just got bigger and bigger and bigger, and the how's got easier and easier and easier. It's kind of the the the, the scales have gone far, the why's gone up and up and up with just sheer numbers, and the how is just well, it's just day to day living. Mm. You know, it's fine. You know, it's it's really cool. Um, and yeah, I I I think that was another another you know amazing moment. You know, this guy, you know, someone in the public eye like Chris Martin. We would take the time to do that and yeah. you know support and and you know send a note an email and you know it was a it was a just a really a really weird moment but amazing For sure. at the same time and um yeah the band have been incredible to me um you know we still keep in touch and you know supportive projects and yeah i mean they're just great guys you yeah know, how we, was because you went to a concert from him 
Yeah, we did. Yeah, how so was we the went concert? To... Concert's amazing. I'm going there on Sunday. I should see them again. Really? We went... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> we went to the concert, and then he invited me to the after party. Me and my yeah. family. And wow. We went to the after party, and I had ten minutes chatting with him. He couldn't. He was just a really nice guy, and he said, "Look, if there's anything you ever need, just email. Anything you want, just email." And I've never emailed him for anything because it's, that's not how we work. But if he, you know, every now and then we send an email saying, look, you just send out a tweet or an Instagram post, you know, if we're looking at a project to raise funds for hospitals or wheelchair projects or stuff that we're doing for other people. Because those guys at the beginning, Coldplay and loads of other people in my community, they really kind of built me up. Mm. You know, they built me up financially that I could afford a good wheelchair, right. and decent arms, you know, decent prosthetics. You know, they really put in the groundwork and, and I will always owe them just as much as I owe the NHS, just as much as I owe my surgeons and Jeff who saved my life. So for me now, it's about, I'll never be able to repay them. I can't give them money to say thank you. But what I can do is work on projects like the wheelchair factory, yeah, affordable prosthetics, treatment for Parkinson's, all the stuff that we're involved in, all the university research, trying to bring better products onto the market for people like me, people with disabilities. That's that's the way that I can give back to them and obviously to people that unfortunately arrive like me and to give them enough of an idea that there's an incredible life out there if you want it, that it's all possible, all doable. Just dream up what you want to do and build the right team and you'll make it happen. That's so amazing, all the things that you're doing. Yeah. Uh, have there actually been any other like books or like uh, podcast episodes or any like words that you read somewhere that also, well, that you could actually recommend to anyone listening who might be going through a tough time or that also just really helped you? I think one of the a fantastic books I read at the start of lockdown was When Breath Turns to Air. Breath um, Turns to Air. When breath turns out, I can't remember the name of the author. Okay. He was a, a neurosurgeon, a trainee neurosurgeon in the US. And then he, he subsequently got cancer, brain cancer. Mm. And it just, it, it it's like a chronicle of what he went through and how he kept fighting to try and be the best neurosurgeon and help people in his condition. And it, it was just a very heartbreaking and inspiring read at the same time. And, you know, I read that, I read how much he did for people in a similar situation. And it made me realize that actually I'm not doing enough. <laughs> you know, you read it and you think, I feel so inadequate up against that guy. So it just inspired, it has inspired me to do more for others, for mm. other charity. It's a great, a fantastic book, but very, very emotional, very sad. I will, uh, for everyone listening, I will put it in the show notes. Uh, I will look it up and I'll put it there. Yeah, it's an it's an amazing book, and he was an amazing man and a legacy. For me, it's I think a legacy is important for people like me. You know that we, I I would not do well having a normal job, working nine to five, and living a, a normal life at the end of that. That isn't that it just isn't me. It was it wasn't me before I fell ill, um, but being able to work on different projects. And choosing what I do, you know, to talk about what happened to me, being open. I'm an open book when I talk about what went on because I find the whole the whole thing is fascinating and equally brilliant at the same time. Mixed in with some tragedy at the beginning and you know ups and downs, but it's ultimately everything in the last nine years has got me to this point. And right now, my life is phenomenal. You know, so that there there is no regret in the last nine years, whereas there's loads of regret prior to that. Um, but all these all these little scenarios and instances just build and yeah they just, they kind of they add they they're like a fuel they're like the electricity to an engine and it just store I store it and it just pushes me on and keeps me going. This next question that I actually have for you, I didn't exactly know where to put it in the interview, uh, so I decided to sort of put it a bit here in the middle. <laughs> Okay. Um, so I, uh, survived like a, a year and a half ago, a sudden cardiac arrest, uh, 
you know, I was asleep and my heart stopped and my girlfriend actually noticed that I stopped breathing and yeah, she responded just immediately. The paramedics were there just instantly um, and I got extremely, extremely lucky. Uh, especially also because I, I could have ended up with like neurological you know problems because of the yeah. lack of oxygen damaging your brain but none of that happened uh, so uh, yeah again I got really lucky um, but I've also like been dealing for like the last pff, 20 years now with a chronic heart disease uh, so that probably led to this cardiac arrest now whenever I talk about this or share something about it to, to friends or, or to just strangers. I notice sometimes, and I'm not saying that this is with everyone, but I notice sometimes that some are hesitant to share any of their problems with me because they yeah. feel like, you know, they feel like that, that it's insignificant to, to, to my problems. <laughs> but when I'm now looking at you, I feel like all my problems you know, are just insignificant compared to all that you've endured and went through. And I know that comparing is is not good, and I tell that to everyone who does it. Yeah. It doesn't help. But I am wondering, have you noticed this in your life too? Like that your your wife Lucy or your son Sam or any friends or family are more hesitant sometimes to share certain problems? And if you did notice it, do you what what do you say to them? And what would you say to anyone listening who might feel this way? I remember, so when I just came out of hospital and I was looking terrible and, and still very unwell, mm -hmm. um, nobody would talk about any of their ailments. Yeah. You know, we had mates, mates with cancer, we had loads of people going through tough times, but they wouldn't want to talk to me about it because they'd look at my situation, like you, like you say, and they'd be like, oh my God, well, we can't discuss it in front of him. Mm -hmm. But then... It, it, after about two years of that, maybe three years, and when they started to see that I was living an incredible life and traveling and work and just doing some really cool stuff, um, then we went through a bit of a phase of like, oh, where are you going, where are you going this week? You know, are you traveling somewhere or we're not, we're going to work sort of thing. We went through that for a bit. And now I'm at a point where everybody will talk about their ailments. Mm. They'll talk about their cold and their flus and their problem. And, and that was a massive turning point for me because I thought if I can make them feel that comfortable in my presence that they can talk about a common cold and moan about it to me, then I felt amazing because I must have got to a point where I'm so at peace with myself and they must feel that that they can now talk about their problems. So that made me, that made me feel even better, really. And I remember uh, one guy doing it. And he and he kind of he kind of went, oh my god, I'm so sorry. I, I didn't mean this. I didn't even really talk to you about it. I'm like, no, that's what I want. You know, I want people to tell me what's wrong with them. You know, because if they, if they don't talk about it, the, the last thing you want is for them to bother that. Up. You know, if you've got a, if you've got a runny nose and it's November, you haven't got strep. Let's not over over worry the nation. You know, um, if it gets worse, go and see a doctor. You know, and it was it was simple stuff like that. But the fact that they were talking about it just made me feel brilliant. That, that all of a sudden I've become that's that's just Alex. It's not it's not that lad that went through a terrible time a few years back and lost all his legs and arms. That's that's just him. That's Alex. And I was I was at dinner at my, a mate's house at the weekend and I met this chap, and he was really kind of worried about how he would react to me. And my mate lives on the top of a hill, so getting down to his garden is a nightmare. So I had to get off the wheelchair and shuffle about 200 yards to the bottom of his garden. He makes me do it. He did it on purpose, I think. I don't <laughs> mind doing it. So I, I, so I shuffled down to the bottom of the garden and um, I was just sat on a on a seat down there and no wheelchair and this guy turns up. And he, I, I remember he, he saw, he's looking at me thinking, how on earth did you get down here? Um, but after a couple of hours, he, he warmed up. He was great. And then he started talking about all sorts of things. And when I went home that night, my mate sent me a text for the day saying, oh, um, Tony, Tony was really worried about it at the beginning until he realized that you are just normal. <laughs> and, that, and that was that. And I thought, yeah, because I am normal. Yeah. I'm not, I'm still a normal, normal man. Yeah. You know, I've still got the same 
issues and problems as anyone else. Yeah, true. It's just, yeah. You know, you know, normal life is still going to affect me, mm. and I know that in in my lifetime, I'm going, I'm going to deal with um, the loss of family and friends. I'm going to deal with people with cancer, other ailments. I'm going to deal with tragedy. That's just part of life, you know. And I'm not, I don't worry about it, and I'm not scared about it. You know, I will cope with it when it comes. You know, you can't worry about what's happening down the line, but to try and make people feel at ease in your presence, you know, at that, that moment when people realise that actually, yeah, he's just an old bloke and he's missing a few bits. It's, it's lovely. You know, I, I don't want them to feel that, oh, God, he's disabled and he can't do this, he can't do that. I want, I want people to see what I can do, not what I can't. Right. It helps a lot that you're not being a victim, right? Uh, for people yeah, exactly. to yeah. just share, you know, their problems too. Because if you're always, like, being the victim, then, yeah, of course, you're going to draw the attention all the time and people will be more hesitant to share anything of their problems, but you are and totally think, anything from that. Yeah, and I think it's visibility as well. You know, I'm I'm happy to be on social media. I'm happy to be photographed, filmed, whatever. You know, I'm really cool about it. But right at the beginning, when none of this was going on, I remember because my best mate gave up his job in France and moved in with Lucy and I. So he and I were trying to figure out what life was going to be for me. And I remember he said to me, he said, what do you want to do? And I said, well, as soon as I get home, you know, I want to spend some time releasing Sam in a few days. And I said, then I want to go out. I want to be in a car. I want to go to a shopping center, a supermarket. I want people to see me now because this is as bad as worse as it's going to be physically and vis as visibly as well. You know, I want people to see me that I'm not afraid to go out. Yeah. I'm not worried about them looking hmm. and I kind of sometimes I feel a bit guilty about it because I kind of put I, I was putting other people in that position on purpose but I had to for my own mental health I had to be I had to be out there and being seen and for them to see that I was learning to wheel my wheelchair independently that I was learning to use prosthetics that I could navigate my way around the supermarket in a wheelchair with one arm you know all these things I had to learn you know I could only do that while being out and about in public. And that's probably one of the best things we ever did to not shy away from what is the rest of my life. You know, my, my limbs aren't going to grow back and I'm really cool about that. You know, I, I, and I know that physically my life down the line is going to get much, much harder. And that's why I need to cram in as much of the adventurous stuff, whether it's the cycling or the rowing or whatever it's going to be. I need to, I need to wedge it in now. Um, Because it's just, you know, life's short, you never know what's around the corner, so don't, don't put it off. <laughs> Before we continue with the interview with Alex, I'd just like to take a moment to mention if you feel that you've gained some insights and lessons from this interview and you're curious to see what else we offer at the IPS Project, I recommend that you check out the IPS Academy, where we offer online courses taught by guests here on the IPS podcast. Learn more about essential life topics such as mental health, relationships, the mind and the body and brain through fun and interactive courses. Simply go to theipsproject.com slash academy or check the description of this episode to find the link. Each course has a few lessons to try for free so you can get a taste of what the course is like. We have countless reviews from other students so you can see what others think. And there is a 30-day money-back guarantee if you end up not liking the course. Again, check them out at theipsproject.com slash academy or by clicking on the link in the description of this episode. Now, let us return to the interview with Alex. Your wife, you know, her life also changed just uh, unexpectedly, right? Uh, when all yeah. this happened. And I have a lot of respect for you and how you, you know, decided to not be the victim or a victim. But I equally have a lot of respect for your wife. What is something or what are some of the things that you are the most grateful for that she did throughout this whole journey? She, so Lucy is, she worked in, she's worked in hospitality since she was 16. So she's worked with the Rue brothers, yeah, White, Gordon Ramsay. You know, she had a hell of a career before she met me. 
And, you know, she was probably one of the first female cooks in that all-male environment mm. in the 90s, late 80s, early 90s. In the bar that you were running? Or well, in the pub? not just, but in, in London and different oh. restaurants. And, wow. you know, she was, she was top of her game. She was a, a pastry chef at the very top of her game. And, um, you know, she, she developed this incredibly thick skin and she's a very driven woman. And I, I really admired that. You know, I could see she was a strong character. I love that. And, you know, she was amazing. But when I fell ill and when I woke up in Winchester, I remember trying to talk to her because, you know, I, I guess I didn't really know what the future had, what the following day was going to be for me, really. But I wanted to kind of know that she was on board and by my side. I needed that support. And when I moved to Salisbury, I remember a friend of ours, a mutual mate, he came in and he said, look, he said, I'm going to have to ask her the question. And I immediately knew what he meant. He said, look, I'm going to ask you if she wants to stay or go because she didn't sign up for this. And I said, I totally agree. I said, I need to know now whether she's going to be with me on this or not. And I remember my, my, my heart's in my mouth. He goes away and he goes into the weight room and he asks her the question. And um, her reaction was, why would I walk away from him? I love him. And then I just said my legs amputated. And, and her next comment was, I didn't fall in love with his legs. <laughs> <laughs> and Amazing. My, and my mate comes back in. That's incredible. So my mate comes back in giggling. And I was like, oh, is it, is it, is it a good answer? He said, mate, it was brilliant. And he regaled that. <laughs> I didn't fall in love with my legs. Well, and then since then, it's just been, yeah, it's been her and I and, and Sam. And it's been incredible. And she has never wavered. You know, she was... She ran the restaurant. She never missed a day of work in all the days that I was in hospital. Not one. Didn't take time, didn't take time off. So Sam, so Lucy and Sam, we well, we all lived above the pub in the countryside and that business went bust. So that that restaurant and that, that pub shut. And then she couldn't live at the restaurant. So they had nowhere to live. So my son and Lucy and my Labrador were bouncing around friends' houses, family homes. They had nowhere to live for seven months. And she still managed to run the restaurant every day. And every day she'd come and see me at Salisbury Hospital. Every single day without fail. She was just relentless in her pursuit to make sure that Sam and the family were stable and that I was stable. And, you know, looking back on it, how on earth she managed it, I don't know. But we, being in hospitality, you grow an amazing network of people. And we all support each other. And I think, I didn't know it at the time, but lots of other people were helping with the restaurant, staff were helping out. Uh, we, had so, we had so much support around us that we probably didn't even know that we had, we had that, much, that much at our disposal because we never asked for it. You know, we, would, we would never say, oh, we need some help. That's just not who we are. But these guys were just coming on board saying, look, what do you need? We'll, we'll help out. We'll pick Sam up from preschool. You know, we'll make sure that the dogs get walked. You know, we'll make sure that all the fruit and veg is taken in at five o'clock in the morning to the restaurant. All this was covered um, while I was going through. I, I was blissfully unaware. And it's only when I came out that I just realised how much of the support that the community gave us. And we couldn't have done it. We couldn't have done it without them. And, you know, Lucy was just amazing in how she cope with it. And I remember... Um, I remember being in Toronto and I was speaking at a, a conference for um, Robin Sharma over there. Yeah, so I was I was closing out the um, the Titan Summit for him. I was the last the last speaker on day four, I think. And uh, we were in Toronto, Lucy and I. And we the day before my talk, I remember we went to a sushi restaurant and I had to climb upstairs to get there. So I, I shuffled upstairs and I jumped on a seat and I was signing my sushi. And uh, I'd never asked her the question, but when my mother and Lucy were told that the chances of my survival were absolutely minuscule. The, the Jeff, my mate, said to him that you need to go home tonight and prepare to say your final goodbye so that he's not going to make it. In the morning, when you come back in, we'll wake him mechanically. He won't be able to hear you, but you'll be able to say your piece and then we'll turn off the machines. So, so that night, my mother and Lucy, I, I'd never asked my mother about it because I think it made me too upset. Um, 
And I kind of built up the courage years later to ask Lucy while I was in this Japanese restaurant in Toronto. And I said to her, Danny, I've never asked you the question. Um, and I feel I'd like to be able to know your answer tomorrow when I go on and close out the summit. But what, what were you going to say to me when they woke me mechanically as a final goodbye? And in my mind, I think I had this kind of idea that it would be this amazing um, epitaph of how lovely I was and how amazing dad I was and I was a great partner and, and all this. Um, and she didn't even miss a beat and she was eating her sushi and she said, all I could think about was who was going to take out the bins. <laughs> and it was, and the delivery was so deadpan and to the point that I just fell about laughing. <laughs> and I, I, I told the story the following day uh. and it, and it was that, that's what's got us through it. Yeah. That kind of dark humour, the the lighter side. You know, she she just kept me buoyant all the time. She still does. You know, and she now, she's gone from that point when I left Salisbury to have one business. She now has five. And she's just amazing. You know, Sam and I are very lucky to have a, a partner like her and a mum like her. You know, she's an incredible lady. Yeah. She sounds amazing. She does. Totally. She is amazing. She hates the limelight. And she can't stand it. Um, and we we just come back from Spain and we were in, in a very lit, tiny little island in the northwest of Spain. And um, she was recognised by a, a couple. Um, and the couple came over and started chatting to her. And she just absolutely hates it. I'm, I'm more than happy to talk to anybody that wants to talk to me about it. But she absolutely hates it. But she deserves recognition, I think. For what she did, how she's been, how she is, you know, just in general. But for those those first few months, you know, all the, all the people in my corner, they deserve recognition for what they did for all of us. Alex, I uh, just have a few last questions for you. So on the social media pages of the IPS project, I also asked like what what people would ask you, uh, and I had a lot of questions, uh, but there were two that came consistently uh that i picked out that i just mm -hmm. want to ask yeah sure so all of us all you know have something physical that we might be a little bit insecure about or that we just might not like how have you learned to accept you know what happened to your body and and to feel okay with it all so right at the beginning when we were talking about prosthetics. And I didn't really know what prosthetics were when I was in Salisbury, so I didn't really understand. But I was starting to see guys coming in the unit, you know, the odd prosthetic leg, the odd prosthetic arm, and starting to get a sort of a glimpse of what my future could be like. And um, I remember being told that I would be able to get these legs and these arms on, on the National Health Service. And unfortunately, when it came down to it, they couldn't really afford me the level of my amputation. Um, but I remember saying to my, I remember Lucy saying to my son, daddy's going to get some legs and arms like that. And my son turned around and said, that is amazing. Daddy's going to look like a Power Ranger. Yeah. And, and he was so kind of like naive with happiness uh, that the minute he said that, it was like, I'm really cool with it now. Yeah. You know, if, I could, if my son thinks I'm going to look like a Power Ranger, then it was great. Uh, and over the last few years, you know, we've worked on different projects with all sorts of equipment. So he gets to play with bionic hands and legs and arms and wheelchairs and hand cycles and motorbikes. And he has this amazing array of kit coming through the door all the time. And he's fascinated by it. And, you know, I think from that moment when he said I was going to be a Power Ranger, it just kind of leveled it for me that actually I could look, I could look really cool with all this kit on. Not that I've ever felt cool, but I feel very content in the equipment that I, I sit on and I wear, you know, I, I, I've got to the point where I love my, I love being different. You know, I love the fact that I stand out. I think the Alex before had nothing to stand out about. Whereas that the Alex now could split a crowd just by what, how he looks. And for me, that's an amazing feeling. That makes me feel like a rock star when I go out. So I, yeah, I think accepting the difference is, is, really mission critical but it only takes your comment you know and I, I'm, I'm in total agreement with my son but why shouldn't i look like a robot or a power ranger you know why why shouldn't i be like a transformer or iron man 
you know, there's no reason why that, that shouldn't happen. And I think with kids now, they all revert to the Marvel and the Avengers. So every every kid that I see is like, we got a hand like um, what the, the 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 baddie in it. I can't remember his name. Oh, um, uh, maybe like a Winter Soldier, like uh, exactly, in Marvel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. there's yeah, quite a few like, people there that you can look like that are really cool. Yeah, there's, there's so many things, and I, I keep saying these kids, look, look, kids, I don't know because they're about hundred thousand pounds, so no, I don't have one. <laughs> but but then it then that drives me to then work on a project in a university to try and drive that cost down. So. Actually, the the idea of the of the of the Power Ranger has kind of instilled the work that I do now, and it's, and it's followed me all the way through. And it, it's all about making this equipment more personal, more more tailored. You know, why shouldn't you have a I don't know whatever you want. You know, it shouldn't have to be a skin coloured plastic arm or a carbon fiber bit of kit you know there, there must be ways in this day and age that we can make it more personal more in tune you know trying to give a, a 14 year old a, 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 a cream colored plastic arm with a hook on the end of it they're never going to wear it it looks terrible but if, you gave, but if you gave them something that looked like an iron man hand right. or had, had the colors of their favorite football team you know something really really simple that personalizes it to them that makes them feel empowered by wearing it. Yeah. Then that makes more people wear the equipment, and that mm. gives them more options, and it, it can only help all of us. Right. Because you know, you know the so, arm, that color, that represents something for them, right? A hero yeah, or something, exactly. someone that they look up to, and that's super powerful for yeah. Exactly. You know, and I, I'm a, a lot of the work and the companies that we work with now, it is all about that. You know, if there's there could be 20 million arm amputees in India. Now, we, the affordable prosthetics company that we, we work with, you know, if we're to get into that market somehow and help these people and give them the right prosthetics, then we need to make sure that we've got every single IPL cricket team colours available to them. We need to make sure that we've got their favourite cricketers or football teams, whatever it is. You know, it, it needs to, it shouldn't just be the same kit for everyone it needs to be personal you're right yeah. and I say you know that that builds their confidence we want people to put on their prosthetics all their equipment and wheel out the door or walk out the door and think i'm looking good today i feel happy in my skin and uh, you know to me that's ultra important yeah that's an amazing goal and that's an amazing thing that you're working on I actually have a little, uh, I have like an ICD, like a little device here in my chest. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but it sticks out of my chest so you can see that there's something here. Um, but uh, people also after, afterwards told me like, ah, you kind of look like a cyborg, like Iron Man now. And I was like, <laughs> you know, I like yeah. Iron Man. He's cool. Yeah. Uh, cool. And it also represents something more than just a little things sticking out of my chest now uh, because of that, you know, because I am a little bit like Iron Man now, like you are. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, that just kind of motivates me because I like that character and what he stands for. And uh, yeah, that helps it, a lot. It does, yeah. I mean, we're very lucky that we live in an age of the yeah. Avengers on screen, that it's far more visible to, you know, a global audience. Um, but if we don't build on that, then it'll slip away and i think we're, we've got a, a a window that's slowly closing to get these products out there and and to give better options for a, a wider range of disabilities you know it's not just amputation it's i'm we're in the process of setting up a schools competition and it'll be global hopefully uh, the year after next and it's all about assistive technology and the design around it so we want children to work with somebody in their network so it could be their next door neighbor it could be their auntie who has a disability and is fed up with a boring walking frame maybe she wants something really cool that she can take on a, a dirt track so she can walk her dog maybe there is something in the kitchen that a person with parkinson's simply cannot use so how do we develop something that they can use so we want these kids to work with end users to dream up ideas that will help them with their disability so this is not and then all the ideas that we will get we will then filter into the university system here in the uk and then hopefully all over the world 
because the brightest minds and the, the, the blue sky thinking is with the children. You know, in, in my son's eyes, I was going to be a Power Ranger. Now, I'm not a Power Ranger, unfortunately, but in his eyes, it was possible. And any other child looking at somebody else would just be thinking, well, hold on a minute, why can't you be like so-and-so? And then designing a bit of equipment with them. So you've got the actual end user working with the child and saying, well, that, that might work. That'd be really cool if that worked. Hmm. I remember saying, I remember saying to my son, why haven't I got drones as wheels? Why doesn't my, why doesn't my wheelchair turn into a drone? There must be a way yeah. that we could design a system like that, that the wheelchair just simply wouldn't need wheels. It would just be a drone. And off How I cool went. would that be? Exactly. That's what I said to him. I said, dangerous, but it'd be wicked fun. <laughs> you know, and, and, and that's, that's where it starts. You know, it's not, uh, I'm running out of ideas for all these universities that I work with. They keep coming to me for ideas, and it's like, what can we do next? What what can we design? And I struggle to give them new ideas each time. So I'm thinking, stop stop asking me. Let's ask the children because mm. they're going, they're going to come up with some absolutely brilliant ideas, and they look at the world in a different way. And and we need to harness that I think early, and then develop it, and then hopefully we get better products in the marketplace for people with disability. You know, that's that's the for me that's a, a big project. We were a huge project. There's something that I think could make a real difference to a lot of people. For sure. And it's amazing that you're working on this. Um, the other question that I read a lot of times from, uh, from people is, and you might have already answered it a little bit, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, how do you deal like with the constant stares from other people when you're out? You know, uh, How do you not get annoyed by it? And... How do you not feel judged by it? Like, have you developed some kind of technique for it? Or what do you do? It's never really bothered me because I got out so early doors yeah. mm. in such a far worse state that I'm in now that I don't think they're staring at the disability. I think they're staring at the fact that I'm either on a motorbike or wheeling around a shopping centre with no arms or, or, or doing stuff that is just like, oh my God, how is he doing that? I don't feel like they're looking at it thinking, oh, my God, look at him. I always feel that they're looking at me thinking, wow, that's amazing. Look at that. I always see the, the, the positive. I've never had any negative reaction to, to what I've been doing. And the stairs at the beginning, you can imagine right at the start, they were just, they were constant. I couldn't go anywhere without being stared at. But I had to get out in front of it. And I had to deal with it early because I, I was never going to look that bad again you know so if i cope with it then now it's it is water off a duck's back so it's about being visible at your lowest i think and it, and it puts you in the most uncomfortable position but it does give you so much strength when you get back indoors to know that you've done it you feel like you've just absolutely smashed something that you would never dreamed you would have could have done and i'd I kind of, I soak that up a bit, you know, it, it just kind of, it, it gets into me and I feel great that now people will come and ask me questions because I, well, I am so at peace with what's going on. I want people to come up to me and say, what happened to you? Or now it's like, are you that guy that climbed the mountain in Ethiopia? It's like, yeah, I am. You know, are you the guy that went across the Namibia on a, on a mobility scooter? Yes, I am. You know, stuff like that. It's great. And, I, and for me, the adults will stare and the kids will come and ask questions. And it's in my mind, it's getting the adults to say to the kids, he's not go and ask him. Don't stare at him. Go and ask him. You know, the adults need to be confident enough to say, right. Okay. So he's in a wheelchair. I wonder what happened. And not to say to their child, no, no, don't stare. Move on. It's to turn around and say, right, go and ask them what went on. And that's, that just builds understanding then. You know, it's all we can do. You know, and, so now for me, I, if anyone's listening and they see me in the street, just ask me the question. <laughs> you know, don't don't stare. Come and find out what went on. I think a lot of us, a lot of us in these predicaments, are very happy to talk about it. It's just that people won't ask the question. Mm, yeah, because they're afraid maybe to insult the person by asking about it, or or yeah, yeah. yeah and I, you know, I I come at it. I have 33 years in a, in a perfectly working normal body and I've had nine in the most, in the strangest of bodies. Um, and obviously people have been born with disabilities. They don't know any different. And I can imagine that over time, 
the frustration can only build because there is no other glimpse of what life was like before it. Whereas I can always compare with my old life and keep pushing against that to not fall back into who that guy was. So I, I'm very fortunate that I have that, that I can compare and contrast in what I'm doing now to what I was doing, how I would react then to a person like me. You know, I don't want to be that guy. I would never have asked someone in my, in my condition, oh, what happened to you? You know, loads of people assume I've been blown up in Afghanistan. Well, I haven't. You know, I just caught a cold. And when people ask and I say that to them, they're like, say that again, you caught a cold. And that's all it was. You know, it's so innocuous to end up like this. And then they ask, you know, what do you do? And, then, and the story just grows and they hear more. And then all of a sudden they'll go home and tell someone that they met this guy in the shopping center and he, had, he did this. And, you know, just build, build that great understanding that he was wheeling around one arm. I've never seen anyone do that. Well, you can do it. You know, if I'm doing it, and I'm not an athlete by any stretch of the imagination, you know, it, all this stuff is is possible. But I think the, uh, the only bugbear for me has been judged by people with arms and legs as to what equipment I need. That drives me nuts. How does somebody with arms and legs know what I need if they have, if they haven't wheeled a mile in my wheelchair? If they have like they suggest what you would need as equipment. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. That that can that can be a bit of a bug there. Yeah. You know. Um and but again that's just they don't know because they haven't asked, you know, they don't know the situation. Um so a lot of the work we do is uh, we do a lot of work with the National Health Service and rehabilitation about a greater understanding of the person's familial situation, their home life. You know, I've, I've been in situations with other people that they live on the fifth floor of a council council block of flats with no lift and they're being given prosthetic legs and they can barely walk. Well, they're not going to climb five flights of stairs. That's completely ridiculous. You know, so the, the equipment, they're not being given the right equipment for their situation. They're being given the right equipment by somebody with legs and arms saying, well, because you've lost your legs, you need to walk. So we're going to give you legs. But that might not be the best answer. You know, for me, it's about the best answer for that person in the situation. You know, and I think I think there needs to be a different way of thinking on that. Um, but that that can only start with conversations and talking about it. You're right. Yeah. Alex, we started this interview by talking about your recent, your most recent adventure that you came back from, uh, and and about a few other ones, right? I also want to end this interview by just asking, uh, what was your actual first, first adventure or adventurous thing that you embarked on? So the, the, the first thing was skydiving. Skydiving? Um, which I, I would never have done when I had legs and arms. Um, and, I, and I did that and I absolutely loved it. Uh -huh. But it was, very, it was obviously very short. It's like a couple of minutes, really, a few yeah. hours a day. Um, but I just fell in love with it. But I guess the first real adventure was um kayaking around the southern tip of Greenland. So I went out with a, a military charity called the Pilgrim Bandits back in 2016, I think. And we flew to Iceland, had a couple of days in Reykjavik, and then went on to the southern tip of Greenland. And we rough camped while we kayaked for 11 days around the southern tip. And it was just unbelievable. Um, and it was something that, it was the first time I was able to repay my best friend who'd given up so much for living with Lucy and I for about six months. He came with me on the trip. So he was out there with me. We were both kayaking around the Southern Green and something we'd never had done as mates prior to falling ill. Um, and it was physically demanding. Mentally, it was uplifting. And I had 10 days with an amazing group of people. Um, and it just that was the kind of the first one that really got me thinking this is my life now i want to do more of this um the skydives are like a little aperitif and then now the main course was that that greenland trip um you know we were tracked by whale we wow was, the nature was incredible the, the icebergs and oh. uh, the glaciers and i was just amazing absolutely amazing the ice cap fantastic it was it was unbelievable um And again, I was the first quadruple amputee to probably ever set foot 
in the southern tip of Greenland. Mm. You know, the stairs there were on they were brilliant. I mean they just didn't stop looking. I could I could have been sat in front of someone for an hour and they wouldn't move, they just look at me. Uh-huh. Um and then they saw me getting a kayak and it was like, What on earth is he doing in there? <laughs> I had sport arms on and I was attached to the paddle and it was just brilliant. But so much work went into it, you know, designing arms that were suit, um, the kayak, um, how we would weight it. And I remember the first day we got into the kayak, we started to paddle. And after about three hours, we stopped and I got out and we were going to camp there on this little island that night. And they unzipped my dry suit and this plume of condensation came out. The next thing I know, I'm being stripped naked and, and changed by all these lads. And I was like, what on earth's going on here? And they said, you don't, you don't understand. Two or three minutes of you in this situation, you would have got hypothermia. And I've got no way of regulating my temperature. So I don't really know how cold it is. And I'm, I'm always hot. So even when it's like minus five outside, I am still in a t-shirt and I'm still hot. Really? So over in Greenland, I couldn't feel the cold. So they said, look, this, this could be a real issue because you can't spend 10 days doing that and being stripped every time we stop for a break. And I said, well, what are the options? I said, oh, I've, I've only got that one dry suit and I've got nothing else. And they said, well, either you do it in the dry suit or you do it in your shorts and T-shirt and you keep the temperature as level as best you can. And then the, the guy said, look, the problem with that is that in a dry suit, if, we, if, you, if you overturn in the kayak, we've got about seven minutes to get you out of the water and get you to land and change before you get hypothermia. Mm-hmm. I, said, I said, okay, that's good. I said, what about shorts and t-shirt? And they said, well, if you go in the water now, it's shorts and t-shirt. You've got about two minutes to get out and get changed. And the guy said, you've got, we've got no way of doing that. You know, our group is so spread out and we're miles from anywhere. He said, the odds of one of the kayaks or other kayaks getting to you, getting you out of the water and then trying to change you he said, it's never going to work. And I said, well, I'm not willing to not do the trip. And he said, well, it's up to you. So the following day, I just went out in my shorts and T-shirt and I kayaked around the southern tip, uh, blissfully blissfully unaware of the danger. Amazing. And absolutely loving life. Uh, in, in hindsight, that was absolutely psychotic. And if I had <laughs> a rock kayak, I would have been in real trouble. But it was groundbreaking from an event. And ground, for me and my best mate, you know, we've been out to Africa now, just come back from Namibia, you know, Ethiopia, more countries to see, more adventurous stuff to do. Um, then next year, we're gonna, I'm going to row the southern tip of England. So I'm going to go from the furthest west on the coast to the furthest east. So that's 370 miles in an adapted rowing boat. And then I'm going to cycle 600 miles back to the west coast of England. Wow. Um, so a thousand, about a thousand miles, we think. And then that's my training for then hopefully tackling the Talisker Whiskey Race or our row across from the Canaries to Antigua. So 3,000 miles. What? That's the, that's the ultimate. For me, that's the, that is, that's the goal. To be able to get to Antigua and say I'm the first quadruple amputee to ever <laughs> row an ocean, that, that'd be pretty cool. Uh, so the, the goal is next year to, to kayak, right? From it, it next, just... Yeah, next year to row the south coast of England. And then that's how I train. Yeah, how many years will you train more? Or is just that year and then you will do it? Like in 2000? Yeah, I mean, hopefully, hopefully we do it in 24 or 25, one or the other. Yeah. I, don't, I think I'd struggle after that. But the mm-hmm. training means, yeah, flat out from about next week, I think, to train mm-hmm. for that. Uh, it'll be good yeah uh well i i'll definitely be following this adventure together with you i am just I'm amazed by who you are and and just your mindset and all the things that you're doing and i'm just so grateful that you took the time here uh to talk about your journey um uh, sorry sorry i was late on the show but no thank you very worry. much for inviting me on don't worry, I was too excited about this interview, so I uh, yeah, I waited another hour, but it is totally okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Alex, there is one final end question that I ask all my guests that I would love asking you as well. But before I ask that question, uh, what is the best place for listeners to you know, check out your projects, uh, any upcoming adventures or any of the past ones that you did? Uh, you know, what are the, like, yeah, the best places for listeners to check out you? 
Um, best place is probably Instagram, and that's the Alex Trust. I'm on there, and then yeah, head to the website www.alex-lewis.co.uk, and then there's there's lots of things in the pipeline. So there's a new foundation. There's the assisted technology competition for schools. There's the row across the south of England, the cycle across the south of England, and then training for the row across the Atlantic. So there's loads, loads more uh, to do, which we haven't updated yet, but we'll update the website as and when. Um, but yeah, keep an eye out. I mean, there's, I've also got the 500 kilometer Le Mans event in a few weeks' time. Mm -hmm. There'll be information on that as well. Um, yeah, I live an amazing life. I'm a lucky guy. Uh, for everyone listening, uh, you can find those uh, links in the show notes. Alex, the last question that I have for you, and this can be as short or as long as you want. Uh, you can take your time with it. From everything that you have seen, experienced, lived and learned in your life, what is the one thing you know to be true? It sounds quite corny, but love does conquer all. Um, without the love of Lucy and Sam. That this this wouldn't this conversation wouldn't be happening. Mm. Yeah. That they they they're my constant, and you know they are they're everything in my world. They are, they are my world, and I do all the stuff that I do, not for Lucy because she thinks most of it's ridiculous, but for Sam to see that at no point did one tragedy or the disability ever get in the way of me having a good time and doing some really cool stuff and helping some amazing charities. So I think as long as he sees that, then I just keep doing what I'm doing. So it all, it all stems from love. Yeah, amazing. Alex, thanks again uh, for doing this interview. Pleasure, thank you much. And that concludes yet another episode here on the IPS Podcast. I uh, truly hope you enjoyed this interview with Alex Lewis and that you gained something valuable from it. Now, to find the things Alex mentioned, such as book recommendations, ways to connect and more info about the adventures and projects he has done and is working on, check out the show notes found in the description of this episode. You can also go directly to ipsproject.blog and search for Alex Lewis. With that, I wish you a lovely day out there and uh, I hope I get to welcome you again soon on another episode here on the IPS Podcast. This is your host, Jelis Vaas, signing off. <laughs>